welcome to the Spyker C8, which is the world's finest Dutch sports car, and also the world's least finest Dutch sports car, because it's the world's only Dutch sports car. Uh, it is a resuscitation of a brand that was active from 1898 until I think it was 1925 or something like that, uh, and then it sort of disappeared. Very well regarded by the enthusiasts of the Netherlands, and uh, maybe not known really by anybody else. Uh, until this, this company uh, was resuscitated in the, maybe 20 years ago and started producing automotive jewelry like this car in which we're currently seated. The interior is, I don't know, kind of steampunk. It's quite charming. There's all these materials that you will recognize like metal and leather and not a lot of plastic, uh, very little plastic at all, in fact. And that's part of the charm. It's kind of like a, um, a diet Pagani, if you will, for a tenth of the money but I think you get a lot more than a tenth the experience. I mean, it's naturally aspirated, it's a manual, it looks cool, everybody wants to know what it is and talk about it. It's a hell of an experience. It's kind of a knife edge sort of car in terms of the experience that you get. It's um, very responsive in almost every respect. Throttle, chassis, steering, it just feels very alive and agile and light. It's kind of like a adult Lotus. Uh, that was derogatory, that was unnecessarily derogatory. It's a bigger Lotus. Uh, bigger and fewer sort of crashing noises from the chassis and suspension. Uh, but a lot of people have asked me about this car, about whether it's just an Audi R8 with a body kit. 100% no. That is completely false. This thing is such an intense, responsive car in a way that an R8 isn't. An R8 is a car that you would, you know, drive to Tahoe, you'd give it to a non-car person and just say, move this car from here to there, and they would be like, yeah, no problem, it drives just like a car. This is not like that. The way that this car reacts to your inputs is very different from a conventional car, and it uh, requires a lot of attention and experience and finesse and sensitivity from the driver. Otherwise, you end up in the bushes or giving everybody whiplash or whatever. So it's uh, in that sense, it's kind of an old car. Uh, it needs the driver to be aware of what, how it's going to react and it requests that you pay attention to driving rather than sort of operating with, with driving as a background process as you do something else. It's kind of an undivided attention sort of car. incredibly direct, uh, responds very quickly, and it makes the car feel very agile. It also has a ton of grip, uh, which makes it quite competent at going around corners swiftly. And the noises that it makes are pretty great too. In fact, let's try a little bit of that. Yeah, seems to sound okay. It's naturally aspirated 4.2 liter Audi V8 which sounds great in this car. Uh, and there's a huge difference when you put it in sport mode. A lot of people complain about the brakes of this car. They do require a good shove. They don't have any assist, uh, but I sort of like that. And the reason why that is the case is because if you want to do a lot of retardation, you can. You just put a lot of force into the brake pedal. But if you want just the slightest bit of deceleration, it's really easy to get that too without overpowering the brake pedal. Uh, when cars have too much assist, it's difficult to modulate exactly the amount of uh, retardation you want. And so that feature about the brakes, a lot of people complain about it because they're used to modern cars. For me, it's actually a benefit. Uh, the other thing that happens down in the pedal box that's a nice benefit is that the, the position of the gas and brake pedal are really well optimized for uh, heel-toe downshift. Uh, and that makes it also really a pleasure to use the gearbox. A lot of people ask questions about the uh, gear linkage. It's a little bit sort of unconventional looking, uh, but it actually works pretty much exactly like you would expect. It's a very normal feeling. It just looks cool, which is nice. I mean, you don't want something like the gear change to really interfere with your experience because then you're thinking about the gear change instead of 
changing gears intuitively, which when you're hauling a bit of mail is not the sort of thing you want to do. You want to be focusing on driving, not managing the car. Perhaps one of my favorite things about the Spiker is how much of an experience it is. If you want to drive this thing every day, I think it might be a little bit too intense for some people. I probably wouldn't mind. Uh, but what this car delivers always is an experience. It's incredibly stimulating in terms of just the sensory inputs that you get as you're operating it, whether you're going quickly or, or not so quickly. It's a little bit tough to drive the car quickly because it's so reactive. Uh, it really forces you to be smooth and quiet down your inputs, more so even, much more so than like a 911. Uh, but what I really appreciate about this car is that it makes whatever you're doing feel special and you feel like you are driving the car. And it does what you ask it to do, even if it's something a bit dumb. And so it's not going to flatter you. It's going to make you work for whatever you get. Uh, and the car will tell you whether you've done a good job or not. And I appreciate that about it. To me, it's a little bit like an old car. Old cars will absolutely call you out if you do something that it doesn't like or that you know isn't in the best habit of driving. Whereas modern cars will just be like, yeah, no problem, I've got it. Uh, so that's what I really like about the Spiker. This car is very much an endangered species. Of course it's a manual transmission, yes it's naturally aspirated, and yes the interior is made of materials that are natural, leather and metal. Uh, and so in those respects it is very much an endangered species, but the experience it provides is also endangered. You feel really directly connected to the car in a way that even the world's, you know, sort of most respected driver's cars of today don't quite feel. You know, a Porsche GT3 is a little bit more friendly and civilized than this car. Uh, and that's a reflection of it being 15 years old, and I think it's also a reflection of the philosophy that underpins the construction of this car, which is that it's a really direct, immersive experience. You know, perhaps the closest thing that you could describe it to is, in a, is a Lotus, in that sense, because you, it's so responsive and light, and there's so few layers between you, the driver, uh, and the car. And so that, to me, is probably one of the most remarkable things about this car. Uh, and it delivers all that for under $300,000, which is objectively a pretty sizable pile of money. Uh, but against the other things that cost $300,000, I think it's kind of a pretty compelling experience. I mean, if you want to go out and feel like you're really doing something on a weekend morning in the car, this is uh, one of the best ways to do that. I think it's much more visceral than you know any mainstream exotic in the $300,000 price range, especially of the last 10 years or even 20 years. I mean, it's much more of an experience than, say, a 993 Porsche, which everyone describes as being super visceral, but it, compared to this, it's a Volkswagen Golf. So, yeah, I, I really like this thing. It's, it's a hell of an experience. If you want to have, if you want to know vaguely what an old car is like, but don't want to deal with all the nonsense of an old car, just in terms of how much of an experience it is, the Spiker is really compelling for that.